Thank you very much. I'm very happy to conclude this uh, really exciting symposium and I hope I won't <clears throat> overlap too much or repeat with what has been said before. Um, and we'll try to describe uh, several aspects where we can better personalize the treatment based on the phenotyping of, of patients. Um, in, and I took the example of uh, ARDS. So these are my conflict of interest. Uh, and what I'd like to do is to drive you through what we do today to what we could do next. And what we do today, for instance, is to set a volume based on predicted body weight, which is a, um, a kind of um, way to uh, based on the uh, normal lung size but we could do better by using the driving pressure which could be a way to set the PEEP based on the ratio of the tidal volume to the compliance which uh, ex much better express the baby lung. I will discuss also moving from the PEEP FIO2 tables to an individual titration of the PEEP based on the lung reputability. And then I go to the classification of patients uh, as subphenotype of the syndrome. So we're all aware of the this uh, COVID uh, respiratory distress syndrome, and also of this recommendation made by John Marini and Luciano Gattinoni, saying if you look, if you have a patient who is more of the type L. L for low elastance, meaning high compliance. Well, you should, even if the patient meets the definition of ARDS, use a more liberal tidal volume of uh, like seven to nine ml per kilogram. This this is a big change, and uh, and although it could make sense, uh, we may don't have enough data to say that this is safe. However. Duan Golliger looked back with Marcelo Amato and others in Toronto at the different database we have from the randomized trial, which tested a low versus a high tidal volume. And the question was, is, is the effect of decreasing tidal volume dependent on the baseline value of elastance or compliance, if you prefer? And uh, this graph expressed the what he called the posterior probability of dying when you use a low versus a high tidal volume. And you see that clearly the two curves diverge, meaning that the higher the elastance, the higher the benefit of low tidal volume. But in the opposite direction, the lower the elastance or the higher the compliance, the less you can expect from about the benefit of, of low tidal volume. And this graph I think is really important. So it, it shows the, the posterior probability of treatment effect, either benefit the two first curves or harm. And this is a normalized elastance, so it looks complicated centimeters of water per milliliter per kilogram. But but just think of using your driving pressure, maybe a driving pressure of 12, and you divide by the tidal volume in milliliter per kilogram of predicted body weight. So you use six, so that makes 12 divided by six, so it gives you a normalized elastance of two. And you see that when you're two or below. The probability that there is a benefit of using a lower tidal volume goes down very quickly, below 50%, whereas the probability that you are causing harm goes up very quickly. So this, based on the data we have, strongly suggests that uh, patient with low elastance maybe should be ventilated with uh, higher tidal volumes and six, and maybe based on patient's comfort and uh, and uh, and other parameters. So very important new way to individualize the tidal volume. 
sorry. The, the second point I'd like to discuss is uh, better understanding why we use PEEP and whether the lung of the patient is recruitable or not. The PEEP FIO2 table is doing a very poor job at that, unfortunately. The best technique to look at the recruitability is a CD scan, but it's, it's far too complex to use clinically. An intermediate technique is the PV curve technique, which show that there is a hysteresis behavior of the lung, which means for the same pressure, once you have recruited the lung, you start from a higher volume, so you, without increasing the pressure, and that's the principle of having recruited the lung. But we designed a very simple test. I have no time to describe the test in detail, but I really encourage you to go to this website. Uh, it's a web page, rtmaven.com, where you will find short videos, like one or two minutes, explaining how to do the technique on any ventilator. And it will tell you whether the lung of the patient is more on the recruitable side, so could benefit from PEEP, or non-recruitable side, which means use the lowest possible PEEP. So the principle is, is very straightforward. You ventilate the patient with high PEEP and abruptly you reduce this PEEP from 15 to five, and you measure the exhaled tidal volume. So you can see that on your ventilator. So your patient needs to be completely passive. But then this volume, and you subtract the uh, inspired tidal volume, uh, can be compared to the volume predicted by the compliance. If the compliance say, well, you can increase by 200 ml with a PEEP of 10, and you observe that the exhaled volume is 400 ml, it means you have recruited 200 ml. And this is introduced into a, a calculator to give you what we call the recruitment to inflation ratio. When it's below 0.5, it's, it means the lung is very poorly recruitable. More, most of the inflation goes into the baby lung. When it's above 0.5 or 1, Mean the lungs is very recruitable and may benefit from high peak. And you see in this validation, well, the, the patients on average tended to have a better oxygenation response and a decrease in dead space when you increase PEEP and when you have a high recruitment to inflation ratio. The next step will be to prove that in randomized trial, it will take time. And we have an ongoing study called CAVIARDS for careful ventilation in ARDS which uh, one of the goal is to, to prove the benefit of using this index. But we already have some retrospective data based on a registry, which suggests that the patients who have matched recruitability and PEEP, which means higher high PEEP when you're recruitable or low PEEP when you're not recruitable, have a better outcome than the patients who have mismatched recruitability. This is not that adjusted data, so this is very preliminary, but this is the kind of data we are looking for prospectively. So moving from one parameter to, to adjust the ventilator to a characterization of the patient. And I would say we have two big uh, uh, possibilities now, either the inflammation or the morphology of the lung. Inflammation, biological characteristics. Uh, this is something people working in the sepsis field are looking for very, you know, uh, uh, in, in many different ways. I call that the dream omics. Uh, it's not sarcastic. I, I just mean that we are not there yet. But the idea is that, you know, having different assessment of the patient response, like, uh, pharmacogenomics to uh, metabolomics, proteomics, could tell you what's the response of the patient to the infection. So maybe uh, uh, adjusting the drug we give and adjusting also the treatment after discharge to offer the best diet, the best exercise profile to the patient. And we have very preliminary data, but very exciting. 
Um, this is a post-hoc analysis of the Vanish randomized trial, which, which compared norepinephrine to vasopressin and hydrocortisone to placebo. And the authors look at the uh, gene response, the gene expression, and they say, well, independently of the outcome or the treatment, we, we see really two different patterns, which they call sepsis response signature, one and two. And they say, okay, does, does it imply there is a difference in the response to norepinephrine versus vasopressin? The answer is no, absolutely no difference. Does it imply there is a difference in the response to hydrocortisone? The response is yes. It seems, at least on this post-hoc analysis, that there is one signature response which is strongly associated with a worse outcome with, with steroids. This could have huge implications, and th this is a very active source of research which may, tomorrow, uh, indicate which patient should be treated by steroids or not. You've heard already from Caroline this data, uh, which I think are very important because they, they, they tell us many things. Not only that uh, this big package of ARDS is not homogeneous, but uh, also that there is mostly, and this is really interestingly found in many different independent trials, mostly two big phenotypes, subphenotypes. One which is mostly inflammatory, you see a number of inflammatory markers very high, and one which is mostly non-inflammatory to make it quick. So these two subphenotypes have a different prognosis. Okay, that's not a big deal. There are many ways to classify patients. But it seems also that they respond differently to treatment. For instance, the subphenotype non-inflammatory seems to do better with a conservative fluid approach, whereas the subphenotype inflammatory seems to do better with uh, um, to do worse with a conservative uh, fluid approach. And they also found difference for high PIP versus low PIP or some of the statins. So this is preliminary, but this is really exciting. This could change our approach to treatment. Of course, one big limitation is that it's not possible to everywhere measure these cytokines. So this last study showing that readily available clinical data could be sufficient is really exciting because we could maybe determine these phenotypes more simply. And of course, uh, in any ICU. The last point I'd like to discuss is the morphology of the lung. Jean-Jacques Ruby, a number of years ago, described that some patients with ARDS have a, what we call, they call the focal ARDS, which means it's very, very clearly delineated and there's no other uh, location with injury. And they separated diffuse from focal ARDS. And they say most patients have diffuse, but there is a like 20 to 30% of patients with focal ARDS. And the, the group um, of Jean-Michel Constantin did a randomized trial and say, okay, focal ARDS should have low PEEP and, and small tile and uh, probably relatively larger tile volume than the smallest one. And the diffuse ARDS should have limited the tile volume and high PEEP. Their intention to treat analysis was completely negative. However, they found that many patients were misclassified, which is a problem for clinical practice. But then when they reclassified, they found a significant difference. And these data are really exciting because they show that, for instance, these subgroup, which are the focal misclassified, having high PEEP, they have the worst prognosis and those who are well classified have a better prognosis. So just to finish, I think we are just starting to see much better characterization of the patients and much better understanding of the uh, significance of some parameters, which will really help to individualize the treatment in ARDS and in other syndromes. Thank you very much.